Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 506. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Monday, the 29th of May, 2019. Okay, welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. You, as an audience member, have a responsibility to keep this show alive. If you want to donate, you can donate to the show by going to anglican.inc forward slash donate. Uh, we can send money to Gavin. We can send money to George or myself. There'll be a, a separate list for who to donate to there. Um, we need you to subscribe to the program on YouTube if you have not subscribed. We need you to comment. Lots of comments going on on YouTube and on Facebook. We like to read those and uh, see what you guys are thinking. And uh, you guys are very opinionated. Probably why you watch a show like this. Uh, if you have not shared this program with a close friend, relative, clergy person, now's your chance. Just copy that link or click the share button on Facebook and let them know that you have lowered yourself to watching the only Anglican program on the internet, Anglican Unscripted. <sighs> George, it's Memorial Day. It's Memorial Day? It's Memorial Day. It's not about picnics. It's not about going to the beach. It's about it, mowing the lawn. <laughs> it's, about mowing, it's not about mowing the lawn. Although they've been doing that around here all day today. Um, it's about remembering uh, those we've lost in war. And uh, here in America, obviously in Europe and around the world, uh, many people have been lost in war, George. Yes, and uh, part of uh, our celebrations this past Sunday were to remember those who served. Uh, we only have one World War II veteran left in the congregation. When I started 25 years ago, you could get a good, oh, I mean, uh, basically the men, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Yeah. Most of them served in one capacity in the war or in Korea. And now we have but the one World War II veteran left, and he is uh, housebound and uh, he was a special effort to bring him to church. Uh, but uh, we do remember the sacrifices that have gone before. And we also have some young men. We have one man who uh, has served several tours in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan and who's discharged with uh, uh, after being blown up by one of these explosives who's having a difficult time. So from someone in their 20s to someone in their 90s, we see the, the present, we see, we're reminded of the sacrifice that the men and women have made for our country. It's interesting because we're kind of watching the, the greatest generation disappear now. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just part of the process of aging, part of the process of, of growing over is watching the, the heroes when I were younger uh, pass on. And other yeah. implications too, which I yeah. I'm becoming more keenly aware of. I was a, a wedding this weekend, and um, on the table I was sitting at, people said, "So, Gavin, what do you do?" And uh, I tried to explain what I was doing, and led to some very interesting conversations. On one side of the table, there were people under sixty, and we began to talk about the elections we've just had. We may refer to with Brexit and 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 populism in Europe. And on the other side of the table, there were a number of us who were over 60. And the thing that joined us together was our fathers fought in the Second World War mm -hmm. and our grandfathers fought in the First World War. And as a result, we were very energized about democracy and freedom of speech. And it became clear that on the other side of the table, about eight or 10 people, big tables, the people who were under 60, whose fathers had not fought in that war, were less energized about freedom of speech and didn't have the same passionate sense of responsibility that I and the others of my age had. And I think that's one of the things that's really changed the way in which uh, both secular society and the church are dealing with this slow moving steamroller that is beginning to eradicate our rights and take away some of our voices. So it's not just we, that our, our veterans are dying, but the memory of those of the next generation is also a crucial link for democracy. Well, what they fought for is slowly dying. They did a poll on USA Today uh, last week that said 40% of Americans support socialism in one form or another. <laughs> what <laughs> are you talking about? What All those lives, hundreds of um, millions of people died under socialism and communism and Nazism. Why? Oh, it, so, yes. Well, 
There's, by losing the greatest generation and losing those voices, uh, we're losing our perspective, George. Well, we're also losing our literacy, our historical and cultural literacy. And I see it in very small ways. Uh, my wife uh, was recently out in the, helping my daughter settle into her temporary lodgings in, in, the, in Los Angeles. Anybody know a decent place to live in Thousand Oaks in part of Los Angeles? <laughs> Let me know. Text me. Write me. Help Cheap. me. <laughs> oh, God, it's expensive out there, and I'm still paying for it. Susan and Laura were in the grocery store, and Susan and Laura, Susan, my wife, Laura, my daughter, and the night before, they in the hotel, they had watched a movie, uh, Cool Hand Luke on television, starring Paul Newman, mm -hmm. and they're going, and Laura had never seen the movie before, and they're going into uh, this grocery store shopping, and they go down the aisle, and they go down the spaghetti sauce aisle, and uh, Laura says, look, we saw him on TV last night. She said, oh, that's him? I always thought that he was like, like Orville Redenbacher, the popcorn king. I had no idea that Paul Newman was an actor because all she knew, she's a 22, 23 year old, educated, intelligent woman, and Paul Newman is the spaghetti king. He's not an actor. But, you know, that's a minor thing, but that cultural literacy, that's something that Kevin and I and, and Gavin can share of a, of a generational thing, is just not being passed on. And whether you call it, whether it's social media's fault, whether it's uh, the uh, collapse of our educational system's fault. What, what we have here, George, is a, a failure to communicate. See, Laura, well, here's the thing. Laura, would, people not know that's a up, for the Laura would not pick up that reference, nor <laughs> would 99% of the high school students today pick up any reference to the Bible or Shakespeare if we that's used true. it in colloquial speech. Uh. We had, we had an incident here in the United States where uh, James Woods, who's, a, who's an actor, a uh, very, very prominent, excitable actor. He's also a very fierce conservative commentator. And he, had a, and he quoted a line from the poet Emerson uh, on, on Twitter, which concludes with hang them all or something. And it's one of Emerson's more famous lines. And he was banned for Twitter for hate speech, for deliberately quoting Emerson. We had better avoid Shakespeare's line, kill all the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but to, 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 we live in a culture now where nobody recognizes a quote for Emerson. Nobody recognizes. No. No. I still think they teach Shakespeare, but they certainly don't teach Emerson in his English no. high school classes. See, even no. if they do teach Shakespeare, you certainly can't quote him because of the whole hate speech legislation. So um, this this problem of amnesia and huge cultural change and the fact that in our education systems teachers have been failing to pass the values uh, of, of the previous generations. I think one of the reasons what's happening is happening is because of the way in which education has been in the hands of the left wing increasingly so, so that now our universities uh, are happy to fire people simply because they upset students even though they may be first class uh, researchers. So this, this a man called I think Dr. Noah Clark, certainly Noah was his first name, and he was doing research into, into, into to racial characteristics and was verging on the possible hypotheses that there are differences between races. This is stuff that's been dealt with uh, time and time again in the decades of the last 100 years. But because he upset people, Cambridge fired him about a month ago. Uh, wow. and so well, we have, here's, here's a the latest little student outrage. Uh, Lillian Gish was one of the great actresses of the silent film era. And up until she was, in, she was on TV the other night, The Night of the Hunter, a uh, Robert Mitchum movie where she plays an older woman, Lillian Gish. And she was also a devout Episcopalian, uh, went to St. Bart's in Manhattan. Lillian Gish starred in the movie D uh, Birth of a Nation, uh, D.W. Griffith, silent film made 1914, I think. And she left a great deal of money to Bowling Green State University. She had no children, and she left her estate for drama programs to less privileged colleges across the United States. The Black Student Union at Bowling Green State University protested this past month that, uh, well, it's offensive to have a woman who starred as a 16-year-old actress in a silent film that was made by something that had passages that glorified the Ku Klux Klan. It's, it so harms us as black students that we cannot go into the drama building named after her. 
And so the trustees of Bowling Green State University changed the name of the theater that Lily and Gish had donated to appease these children who were upset that about a movie that was made almost 100 years ago. Where uh, she was an actress, a, a famous, not even the author. A famous activist just got Me Too'd yesterday. Uh, if you were watching the Daily Mail, you would have seen that the Martin uh, Luther King Jr. was Me Too'd by the uh, FBI leak uh, about all his affairs. Uh, he had all, close to 40, and they have uh, him talking about them on on the record and his uh, the autobiographer the most famous one who wrote the Martin Luther King autobiography sorry I didn't mean autobiography uh, found these and he finally published them and he's uh, uh, it, it's amazing to see now what they're going to do with Martin Luther King's legacy it's going to be huge but we're talking of memory and mm -hmm. cultural memory I need to fess up to a failure of my own memory because last week we were talking about uh, a scandal of, of crosses being covered over in Darlington. And I was so excited about the Sunday Times and the the uh, way that the story evolved. I completely forgot to give credit to the breaking of the story, which actually came from Jules Gomez on the Isle of Man and, and the the rebel priest. And it was Jules is a assiduous journalist that broke that and put it into the public space. That's what the genesis was, yeah. Which was really important because if it hadn't been for that, we wouldn't have been able to talk about it, and some of the some of the conversation that's taken place wouldn't have happened. So that was that was excellent. I do want to follow up quick. We've talked about Brexit now uh, since the vote, and now we learned this week that uh, May's stepping down. What's the latest? We're in a, a period of enormous transition. The European mm -hmm. elections have taken place, and throughout Europe, the same thing has happened. And that is, in the struggle between populism and globalism, or populism being nationalism mm -hmm. there's been a huge resurgence of national votes i think nigel farage's brexit party is now along with angela merkel the biggest single party in the european parliament not that the european parliament has any power of course but nonetheless it's an extraordinary thing to happen so in england the ramifications of this are that the two-party state seems to be broken but of course it won't be really broken until there's an, a general election and we move to proportional representation if that happens, which will have its own vices, but the, it's, it's kind of frying pan into the fire moment. But uh, all we do know is that the voice of the people has made itself heard. And, and I was reflecting um, on the fact that there's a strong parallel between political hearing and, and spiritual hearing. So that in the political, st st well, let's go back. I in the church at the moment, one of the things we're complaining about is that people who lead us, the, the clerical class, are not listening to the word of the Lord. They're not hearing the Bible. They're not hearing the call to biblical values. They're not hearing the call to redeem society and to get society to model itself on the word of God and the templates that he's offered us. And the same kind of deafness is taking place in the political class. So the political priests, who are the MPs and the politicians, are not hearing where the source of their authority comes from, which is the people. So we're about to see, we hope we're about to see something like a political reformation, which will increase democratic accountability politically. It would be very good if we could try and achieve the same kind of spiritual reformation once again in our time in the church today. I don't Gavin, see they, go, for, go ahead, George. Gavin, are they not hearing or are they rejecting what they hear? Is what a very good question. I think you could ask both parties, both political and spiritual leaders, that same question. Um, I guess it's a mixture of both, George. They're certainly rejecting what they do here. Uh, and they're, they're thinking that they can get, well, it's about power and the corruption of power. They have power and they want to hold on to it. And they think their opinions are the correct ones. And rather like May, uh, Mrs. May in, in office, she went on holding on to her position in office, even though her legitimacy had disappeared a long time ago. So it, it appears to be power versus authenticity in both the religious and the political sphere. I want to cover another story from England. Uh, before we do, I need you to give us some background, Gavin. Tell us who the mermaids are. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're in the water, Gavin. Come the on. mermaids <laughs> are an immensely well-funded pressure group of transgendered activists immensely well funded uh, and political parties and the government and councils and funding agencies are falling over backwards to give them money 
uh, and along with money to give them a platform to teach. Now, the uh, the things that they're saying, um, some of them are simply not true. So before we came on, I listened to a bit of the video where uh, to do with the vicar who we're going to talk about, I think. Yeah. And in the training session that was recorded, I heard one of the mermaids say, 10% of the world are LGBTQ. Hmm. Now, we know that for a long time, um, uh, American activists about 10 years ago claimed that 7% of the society was gay because if you pick the number 7%, that means in everyone's extended family, there's somebody who's gay. And that was one reason they picked that number. In England, the National Statistical Survey said 1.4 people were homosexual and 0.04 were suffered from gender dysphoria. Now, these are tiny numbers, but for, a, for, a, for a, an activist being funded by government and other agencies to say ludicrously that 10% of the population and therefore of all schools are somehow engaged in LGBT Q plus profiling. Well, well, it's just a lie. It is. Let me read the, the headline from the Daily Mail. Vicar resigns after being silenced over a Church of England school's plan to keep an eight-year-old pupil's sex change a secret from his parents. This is uh, Vicar John Parker, and I thought we could talk a little bit about the story. Um, the story is the school doesn't want to tell the parents that this kid is going to get a sex change operation. No. Nope question is it his parents or the other parents um, the the answer is that um, well let's go back one stage at the same time that this story is appearing uh, there's another story to do with the scouts now the scouts had the mermaid organization come and train them nine months ago mm -hmm. and when people heard what the mermaids transgenderists were imposing on the scouts uh, there was a lot of fuss in the last nine months, the scouts have now said we're rejecting that information, that training. Mermaids, they, they, they're irresponsible, they had it wrong. We don't accept the training we were given. And particularly, we don't accept the fact that there must be complete silence if somebody is transgendering in a public group like the scouts. So they, they said other parents need to know, if only to help their own children deal with the questions that they're going to inevitably ask. So at this level, both in John Parker's school under the mermaids training and in the scouts, one of the biting questions was, can the parents of the children who share the space with the transgendering child know about what's happening? Mermaids want to say they can't know. That's crazy. So Vicar John Parker has to resign because he disagrees with this. He asked questions, it went up the chain, and his bishop didn't back him up. Well, he's a, a, common, a common refrain in the Church of England. The bishop didn't back me up. Well, it's worse than that, much worse than that. So John Parker, first of all, is a very well-known Anglican clergyman who's extremely, uh, he's, he's linked to uh, some, some, some uh, well-known other activists in the evangelical world. And his church is a famous church. It's had very, a number of famous vicars. I won't give you a history lesson, but it's a, it's a kind of totemic place in many ways. Now, John happens to have an Oxford degree in biology, so he considers himself reasonably well qualified to talk about issues of, of gender. And during this training session, uh, he was shut up by the mermaid tra trainer saying, this is training, we're not interested in your, quote, personal opinions. So he went to the, the diocese and said, look, I don't think I can continue as a, as a school governor in the face of this kind of suppression of free speech and this imposition of of factually wrong cultural values on the children we're responsible for. And that was where it became very exciting because it turned out that this diocesan Church of England school had asked the mermaids in. And uh, the, the educational spokesman for the Diocese of Chelmsford said, you know, this ghastly, stupid, vacuous, worthless, lying euphemisms they use all the time. The Church of England is a diverse, inclusive place where we welcome all kinds of people, which is, is sheer uh, left-wing mantra and tells you nothing and stops all conversations happening. So when the, the priest who holds his license to the bishop reached out to the bishop to say, where is truth? Where is pastoral care for the children? Where is honesty? Where are facts? Where is Christianity? Where is the gospel? Where is the New Testament? Where is Jesus? And the bishop essentially told him to shut up. He said, you can have your license back. And he's resigned in the Church of England. And this ought to be 
a really interesting moment. It should be because he should have a place to go, George. Well, I wanted to ask Gavin before we we jump there. Um, were were the mermaids doing something that contra that contravened the Church of England's educational guidances, or was this in, in others? Was he did did he have a leg to stand on, saying that these people are teaching something that the hierarchy have said you may not teach, or were they teaching something that was approved by the hierarchy? Uh, let me quote let me quote to you from uh, the Reverend Tim Elborn, Director of Education for the Diocese of Chelmford said, Church of England schools are inclusive environments which nurture peoples to respect diversity of all kinds. And then he goes on, our schools must comply with the legal requirements of the Equalities Act 2010. Additionally, he says, the Church of England through its policy of valuing all God's children, brackets forward by our Archbishop Justin Welby, close brackets, updated in 2017, gives guidance for Church of England schools. Now, both those last two things, the Equality Act and valuing all God's children, this is smoke in your eye. There is no direct link from the Equalities Act to the mermaids teaching, though people constantly pre pretend there is. Uh, and valuing all God's children uh, has nothing to say about whether or not parents in a school should be kept completely in the dark about other children's transgendering. So what I hear you to be saying is that the Director of Education for the Diocese of Chelmsford either was misinformed or he lied to the Daily Mail to uh, permit the exclusion of truth, of sound teaching, of sound practice from a Church of England school. It was either a lie or it was a massive mistake. Is well, this I think no, I think it's something more, more, slightly more subtle than either of those two things. I think it is the engagement in Newspeak mantra in order not to have to deal with the facts. So Newspeak mantra is, is diversity and reference to the Equalities Act. It doesn't actually, it doesn't mean anything. It certainly doesn't deal with the fact that we have biological questions on the one hand in direct conflict with cultural and ideological ones on the other and the fact that those who are pressing the cultural changes are referring to pieces of legislation which give them some kind of cover in some circumstances, but which almost always involving going to court to discover what that really means. Now, for the Church of England spokesman to hide behind a new speak mantra simply means we are taking the, we're taking the side of cultural progress and we're ditching our priest and his, and his uh, request that Christian tradition, the Bible, and Christian revelation play a part in what we do and in the way we teach in school. So, so as I so as I take away, Gavin, what you just said, and these are my words, not yours, because you live there, I don't. <laughs> uh, following in a good European tradition of totalitarianism, language is God's gift to liars. Yes, um, we definitely play that. The, mis yeah. the misuse of language, <laughs> the, deli the deliberate misuse, the deliberate obfuscations of of. Uh, of facile mantras. I mean, it, it's, 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 it's not, see, lying would be easier because with lying, you can test it and say, oh, look, you're calling black white and it isn't, we can test it. But, but the deliberate obfuscation with you speak means you can, it's like placing the soap in the bath. We, you, know, when, uh, you know, you never can quite get hold of it to hold, to make it accountable. It's much worse than lying, George. Lying would be clean compared to this. And are these the reasons why this priest resigned he could not he could not allow himself to be are we reading too much into this uh, was this an excuse to jump out of a crappy parish or was this a statement of conscience for a man who felt that he could not be part of a corrupting lying system well what do we know we're only commentators who get information secondhand but the things that i do know are that he's a very well spoken of man he's highly regarded people like him and he's done an excellent job in his parish it's an evangelical parish. He's an evangelical clergyman. They're biblically based. Uh, this sounds like a man who's finally whose patience has snapped in the face of trying to stand up to a juggernaut on behalf of the children that Jesus tells us to protect and discovered that he's been both stabbed in the back and had the carpet to ground taken from under his feet by his bishop and his diocese while he tried to do it. He's an interesting example because as a scientist, he has science on his side, he has reason on his side, he has church history on his side, he has scripture on his side. 
Um, he has anthropology. Everything is on his side except the mermaids and his bishop. Right. And the Church well, of England. And, and, and the whole culture of the Church of England as it has been presided over by Archbishop Welby and represented in his foreword to that particular book on transgendering. So uh, it's, it's, it's a climate change in the Church of England that's also playing its part in undermining uh, many people. So when I see talented vicars step down, I always, you know, here in America, there's choices. If you're an Episcopalian, you're unhappy, you go to the ACNA or the Presbyterians, there's other choices to go. Maybe or to Florida. Or <laughs> to Florida. <laughs> there's other choices. When a Church of England clergyman steps down, what are the other choices? Well, that's what I asked myself a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> Florida. Um, <laughs> Florida. <laughs> there was a nice parish in Florida that I recall them applying for. Mm. Um, but putting that to one side, the serious answer to a very focused question is there aren't any. And that, that's partly because we don't have the backwards, the pioneer spirit that you Americans have had for some time now. We have been, particularly in the Church of England, used to a state church which provided for us from cradle to grave, like a microcosm of the socialist state. And the Free Church of England, for example, might be a place he could go, but they don't have many resources and many parishes and many houses. Uh, the, the, you can't just walk into another institution. And, and also, why should you? Why should you simply change denominations because your patience for your, your, your domestic one has run out? Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, there is, there's nowhere else Anglican he can go, which is one of the reasons why a number of us are putting as much energy and thought and prayer and, and common sense into seeing if there's anything we can do to create some kind of orthodox Anglican network. There's certainly no money and there are no resources, um, which is why when you invite people to, to offer money and resources, we couldn't be more grateful because there's none whatsoever. Yeah. But there isn't, an there isn't even an ideology. There's not even a way of thinking yet beyond, beyond Amy, I think, and the Free Church of England. And they're both really, I don't mean to be, to, to be disrespectful, but they're both quite, quite small as organizations. And Amy has yet really to get off the ground, I think. And, and, and so far, may not, I've yet to see the ambition to be the answer to your question. The Free Church of England certainly has the ambition to be your, the answer to your question, they've said so. And maybe they both do, but we're in very early days now. Mm -hmm. Gavin, um, I remember spending a week in Jerusalem in 2018, where we talked a great many things, but one of the major topics of conversation was this exact issue. Yeah. We saw the ACNA take off. Now, the ACNA had, after the uh, first Jerusalem conference, but the ACNA had the advantage of inbuilt institutions just moving sideways, whole dioceses and things mm. of that nature. What, how, can we compare the situation to the U.S. 10 years ago to the situation in the U.K. today? No, no, not, not really. Uh, um, I mean, indeed, one of the reasons why I accepted responsibility that makes me look potentially idiotic and irresponsible of trying to offer some kind of diocesan framework was because there hasn't been any, apart from the, the historically very clearly defined Free Church of England. But um, the, there, is, there is simply, there is no framework for doing this. And one of the reasons why I and a few others jumped up and down at GAFCON in Jerusalem and said, look, please, please start a new Anglican Orthodox communion separate from Welby and the direction of the Church of England. Because if you don't do that, it's going to be very hard for us to develop the legitimacy, the psychological legitimacy, That's theological right. and biblical, we can manage. But the psychological legitimacy of saying, you, you will not be able to remain in an apostate Church of England, many of you. And therefore, we do need to have a separate Anglican identity and we need the primates to model that for us now if the primates keep on uh, Doing what Chamberlain did with Hitler in the Second World War if you don't mind me bringing it back to the Second World War again Which is you know saying peace in our time. Well, we're gonna send you messages. Well be We're telling you how uncomfortable we are with what you're doing and the way you've treated tech and your principles your lack of principles and these we want these messages to We really want you to pay attention to them 
you know, we know that that hasn't changed anything. It's done nothing. And we need a structural separation, not because schism is good, but but sometimes on the on the sort of the cancer analogy, if you don't cut it out, it'll disease the body. We have to have two kinds of Anglicanism, one which is orthodox and biblical, and, and one which is going to, which is which is uh, living out of the progressive culture. To, to do that, we need the primates to model it for us. I saw this story, it, I believe it appeared on the Mail on Sunday, is that yeah. correct? Or, yeah. And Christian Concern put out, a, put out its own story. I've not seen anything from GAFCON UK or the AMIE or GAFCON internationally. Now, it is a holiday today in the United States, but can we, should we, can we, will we see something to are, are, is there going to be a life raft for this fellow? Is there going to be a response from those institutions that are trying to form and coalesce? I would imagine this is a perfect cause celeb. I mean, uh, unless you want to shoot an arch, an, Ar an Austrian archduke in East London, there's no oh, other geez. thing that's going to happen this week uh, that will enable you to uh, begin the church war. Jules, I hope I hope you were quoting. I mean, sorry. Um, George, I hope you were quoting Emerson there or something because that sounded like hate to me. The incitement to, to but perhaps you won't be able to find an Austrian archduke uh, uh, on the streets of London. It ought to be able to find them, them when you need them. I'm sorry, but <laughs> That's right. I mean, I hope you know maybe Anglican Unscripted could interview people who are who are taking the strain at the moment and ask them if they have plans they can share because this ought to be a, a moment when first of all the church rallies around him and says a resounding yes you're absolutely right all those things that kevin listed are on his side the the, the there ought to be a resounding yes from christians in this country say we are behind you we back you maybe we should raise money for him let's all give 50 pounds to make sure the man has a roof over his head and an income for a year or something and then uh, and then talk to him about whether there's an, whether he wants to go on being an Anglican, and if so, who with? But at the moment, the silence. Yeah, but this isn't going to be the first opportunity or the last opportunity. I can cite probably a dozen opportunities in the last two years where a GAFCON in England could have set up and said, here's an example. We're going to provide something for this person. He's going to enter the ministry of GAFCON in the UK or something. Who knows? But... Uh, There'll be more opportunities, I assure you. I want to move on to one more news story before we go. Yeah. Can I just tie one little thing in? Sure. I. It's so sad or depressing, if you will, that, Kevin, you're right. There have been all these opportunities for the last two years, but nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we have a group within the Episcopal Church called the Communion Partners, and they advertise themselves as conservative Episcopalians. Like, I mean, I am of that mindset, and but they want to put together some institution to support each other as a minority group. Well, we had one of their members, Bill Love, uh, sacrificed. Thrown <laughs> under the bus, ran Thrown over, and backed over. <laughs> Did the communion partners do anything? Was there any... No, they didn't do anything. Um, so, in one sense, I'm beating up the English conservatives for not being more activist Whereas the American Episcopal conservatives are taking the same stance, okay. you know, forming nice little lunch clubs, but they don't really do anything. Protect the corporation. And yeah, that's what they're doing. It's sad. They don't, even, they don't protect each other. They just cover their own asses. Yeah. Uh, let's move on. We talked about this two weeks ago. Oh, I can't say that. I'm sorry. That, that will be offensive to some of our members. Uh, uh, I'm going to get another three-page letter saying you can't use the word asses or jackasses on Anglican Unscripted. Oh, well. Unless yes. Emerson used it and you were quoting. Yeah, yeah Amber, Emerson, Old Testament, lots of stuff. Let's move on and talk about the story. Uh, it's a kind of an old story already, but uh, we talked about Cana breaking up, uh, Cana leaving uh, the ACNA, and we have good news and bad news to report. First, I want to talk about uh, Cana East under Bishop Julian Dobbs has voted to join the ACNA and not have equal ties with the Church of England. Uh, Nigeria. The, gosh, the coffee is not taking effect. When it's a holiday, where we're taping this on Memorial Day, the brain is just gone. I'm lucky I'm even over here talking. Nigeria, Church of Nigeria, not England. And uh, the Diocese of the Trinity 
which is a uh, Kena organization, voted to leave the ACNA or not have the same level of partnership with them. And the Diocese of Kena West also voted to uh, stay with the Church of Nigeria and leave the ACNA or not have an equal partnership. George, what are the latest updates beyond that? This is a very confusing story Mm -hmm. because we're getting information from both sides that contradict each other. Correct. Uh, what am what am I talking about? Well, when Cana was formed, it was formed as a life draft for American Episcopalians who needed an Orthodox covering, akin to support from Nigeria, Uganda, Kenya, South America, West Africa, so on and so forth, and Rwanda. Um, those provinces folded their churches into the new ACNA. The Nigerians uh, kept a thumb in the American pie so that Cana would be a constituent part of the Church of Nigeria and a constituent part of the Anglican Church in North America. Now that, uh, and then that was the the beginning. 2011, the Church of Nigeria pulled a fast one, and without telling, the ACNA formed the Diocese of the Trinity, whose job was to serve Nigerian immigrants to the United States. At that time, there was Cana East and Cana West, and they had American and Nigerian and other ethnic uh, back people background. But So then there became three, two, an Eastern and a Western diocese, and a one specifically for Nigerian residents of the United States. Mm-hmm. This spring, the Church of Nigeria, without telling the ACNA, added four more bishops. Now, one of these bishops caused a bit of a furore because he is on the record preaching the prosperity gospel. Now, what does that mean? He believes that if he had faith enough, he could overcome sickness and become rich, and you can too. And that uh, he uh, advised people to follow the teachings of Benny Hinn, uh, who's a very famous prosperity gospel teacher. Now, this caused a bit of a ruckus in the Diocese of Cana East because many of their clergy were absolutely appalled that this man would be put forward as a bishop who is not even an Orthodox Christian. Well, uh, more more back and forth, back and forth, and we now have one side saying, well, Cana, it was never meant to be a uh, migrants-only diocese. It was never, Cana West never was part of the ACNA. Uh, We have uh, uh, the startings of the rewriting of history. And I'm really trying to be careful because I have been told things by leaders of the different churches in the diocese that are absolutely, that I know to be false. And also I'm told things that, well, somebody told you that this was true. And I know that to be false. Now, it does me no good to, to, uh, wrestle in the mud with some of these people but it really looks this is a not this is this is not the uh, well I'll, I'll, I'll offer my editorial opinion John Stott gave a very famous sermon on the uh, baptism of Cornelius the Centurion and in this sermon he spoke of a homogenous church is a defective church a church that see, seeks to be ethnically or religiously or cultural homogenous is a church that is a failed church in a Catholic sense. Mm. My impression is that this desire for Nigerianness is a sign that it's a failed church. Good luck to them. They're not part of the ACA anymore, but I think they're a bit disingenuous when they hold themselves out that they're being led by the Lord. I think yeah. they're one of the things that work you can tell how this broke up, that uh, true discernment was probably not used. And I used the word a couple of weeks ago, you know, just men making kingdoms. I'm seeing fiefdoms being made here. You know, the kind of feudal warlords just fighting over territory, fighting over uh, uh, their rights, and they get to call the shots and play the game they want to play. And they don't want any oversight from uh, people like Archbishop Foley or Gafka. GAFCON or ACNA leadership. And part of, uh, because I've been around doing this for so long, I know where the bodies are buried. Um, 
there was a long time for many people who in the emotional thrill of leaving the Episcopal Church looked and idolized the African Church as being a paragon of virtue. That look how wonderful these people have come in and saved us from that mean bishop in, in our capital city. That's, that was an entirely understandable emotional response. But we need to understand, and I have written stories about the Church of Nigeria, the Church of Uganda, the Church of Kenya, the Church of Tanzania, the South African Church, uh, on and on and on and on of corrupt, venal bishops. Evil is not restricted solely to the Episcopal Church or the Church of England. No. Uh, one of the founding Grafcon primates uh, has since been deposed for misconduct, financial and sexual misconduct. Um, you could, I could go on and on and on. Now, I'm not doing this to blacken anybody's name, but the Church of Nigeria is not a perfect church. It has grown phenomenally quickly, but part of that growth has been a sort of decline in some of its standards so that you do have bishops who are corrupt. I've written stories about them. You do have, uh, now this is not to say all Nigerian bishops are corrupt. No, not Church all. Nigeria is corrupt. But when I hear this, I've, I'm, I have to be tied to the Church of Nigeria because that's the only way I can be a member of the Anglican Communion and a true Anglican. The problem with that is that Peter Akinola and Nicholas Oko have said the ACNA are true members of the Anglican Communion. You don't need to be Nigerian. So these people who are making this claim are contradicting their archbishops. And then they're contradict... Friends, it, it's so easy to to toss stones at your theological opponents to miss the fact that there are scoundrels in both camps. One of the... Some of the largest founding parishes of the ACNA, their clergy, Trinity Vero Beats, their clergy within a year or two of joining the ACNA were bounced out. And it later emerged that the reason why they pushed their churches so hard was because their bishops were on to them. Trinity Vero Beach, the man was an adulterer. I was on the diocesan board. We knew that. And then he raised the flag of the ACNA and all this and that and the, pulled the parish out and of course bishop Powell didn't fight dirty and say man you're just doing this as a smokescreen well eventually when he moved when it dust settled john guernsey deposed the man with the file that bishop Powell put together hmm. now i know this is going to be very hurtful to some people who think that's you know their churches are perfect paradigms but we're dealing with fallen broken people we've and all said this national stuff it just really irks me it, it it's crazy to watch this again. However, this is a growing process for the ACNA. This is going to be a growing process for GAFCON. Uh, when you brought all those kittens together, like we spoke of uh, Bishop Duncan and uh, certainly done again with, the, with GAFCON, this is part of the problem. We brought everybody in. Good tier leadership, second tier leadership, and some failed leadership. You brought, and, you brought excellent, godly men and women in, and you also brought people in who shouldn't, who were in danger getting or had been kicked out of the Episcopal Church for misconduct. Mm. And they could wrap themselves around the claim of persecution when they were actually crooks and cheats and liars. Yeah. I want to personally thank uh, Bishop uh, Dobbs for being the adult in the room uh, in all this and Bishop doing the Dobbs right thing. Bishop is being accused of being a racist, for goodness sake. <laughs> you know, I know, it just... Uh, this is a man whose career was spent in standing up for the persecuted, persecuted church. And he's yeah. now being portrayed as a trying to form a, an elite Anglo-American diocese. Come on now, that's racist talk. That's offensive. Yeah. And it's, it's actually factually incorrect. It's horrid. People, we're going to move on. I want you to especially if you're an American uh, or anybody, uh, to remember those who died in war this week uh, as you uh, uh, understand the freedoms that you have. Uh, that was a sacrifice somebody else gave for your freedom. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening, I think, to episode 506. We never discussed it. Is that right? Yes, you got it. And once again, my memory is, 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 is flickering. Five. 
<laughs> feebly. So, let's go for five oh six. And thank you for your patience. And uh, we'll uh, keep keep praying. Pray for the church. Pray for repentance. <laughs> <laughs>